All right, what's up dudes? We are finally on to the Q&A portion. So um, I'm actually recording now. So if you guys have questions on YouTube, please write them out. If you have questions in chat right here, uh, type them out and then we can talk about some things. So what did you guys want to talk about today? I might bring someone on in a little bit. Um, if not, then we will just, we'll rant, we'll talk, we'll make this kind of podcast style and uh, we'll talk about certain identifiers or just what it means to be a trader. But what did you guys have questions with particularly today? If there are any questions, I could just start talking about shit. You guys hit me if you have any questions. I do, I do remember though, um, if I go to threads, you guys want, <laughs> this is awesome, man. I bought um, for Christmas, I got, I knew Bao wasn't a big gamer, but his son comes and visits him all the time. So I got him the Xbox Series X and I was like, I bought him two controllers just in case Bao wanted to play, but uh, got them on and I was like, dude, go crazy, man. His kid's like the nicest nine-year-old you've ever met, dude. He's the coolest little kid, man. Um, okay, so a couple questions from earlier. Tosh, could you, do, uh, could you do a bit about if you should be longing a stock when making a pre-market, uh, I guess, game plan, like identifying what you should be looking for, like size or float, institution, ownership, a throngs to look out for on BAM SEC. Um, I would attend, but sending pizza. Oh, shit. Okay. Well, the whole thing is like Robert will probably watch the replay. Guys, I'll answer it like this. I'm going to keep it as simple as possible. When you are a trader, everything needs to be pre-planned pre-market. There's nothing that you should be winging unless it's a reactionary trade where you have a considerable, a considerable amount of edge. A cons like I showed you on the death candle earlier, like a considerable amount of edge. So like, like, let me just show it one last time. This is more of a reactionary trade. You can still plan this like Alex did pre-market, but every now and then you see a stock running intraday and you're like, dude, well, obviously this is more of a short seller bias, but maybe you get the opposite. You get a teleport candle for a long. This kind of throws everything up in the air, right? This is kind of that moment that like the slow motion and like you're gunning down the zombies in World War Z or whatever it is. This is kind of a reactionary moment, but unless it's something like this, like I will not trade this stock until a death candle. Oh, the death candle just happened now that I'm prepared for that. But still, even a reactionary trade is kind of planned. But everything you do as a day trader, guys, is planned pre-market. And that's why we have the watch list. And Alex, every single day, is saying, guys, if these don't happen, I'm not trading. And whether you, you know, follow Alex's watch list, whether you create your own, everything you do starts pre-market. And I'll say it like this as well. I'll say it like this. There's many times when someone asks me, they're new to trading and they're new to short selling and they go, Tosh, when do I get locates? I go, brother, it, that's like planning a trade. You get locates the second your eyes open as fast as your freaking broker opens and you know what's running and you think you have an edge in trading one of those or you're going to trade them. That is when you get your locates. You don't wait. You don't wait. You got to act. And, 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 and this is about planning. You don't wing it. You plan. You plan your every trade. I hope that's clear. Okay, let's go back. Ah, Travers, what's up, buddy? Can you talk about finding balance between sticking with one setup and mastering it versus adapting, moving on to something else if that setup isn't working great in the current market environment? That is a really good question. Um, there's many ways to actually answer this, brother, but you know what? I actually want to hear from you, Travers. I'm sure you're still listening. Brother, give me, give me more specifics on your process. Like, like, tell me why you're asking this question. Like, I actually want to know what's your main process. Kev, what's up, buddy? You can even just type it out if you want. Yeah, yeah. Anytime after the holidays, bro, it's usually a little bit slower um, because people are just tired. People are lazy. They're waiting for the new year to get on their new year's resolutions. I've always noticed it's, a, it's very much kind of no man's land and kind of slow right now until the new year, for sure. But Travers, if you can, man, yeah, type that out. I really want to know specifically what your personal mindset is versus general. Because obviously, you know, the general answer is you should not move on to the next thing until you master something that you like, unless you absolutely considerably hate it, you should move on. Like not everybody's made for options trading. Not every mate one is made for small cap trading. So flush out what your what you want to build a process around. But if you're stumbling upon what you're building a process around that you do love, that doesn't mean you should just go to the next thing just because you're having a couple roadblocks. But I, but I do want to flush out specifically, brother, on what you're, um, maybe you're having an ailment specifically right now. Let's, let's see what that is. Yeah, I definitely want to flush this out. 
So it's kind of, as you, for anybody listening in, it's kind of like I'm going to help Travers personally right now, but, it, but you can, but if you're going through something similar, you can kind of, um, you can kind of parlay this into your own process or your own setup, or how can I understand what this kind of common thought process is? Because, you know, just because he might say, okay, let's see. So I'm trying to add a second setup right now because I've spent the year trading first bounces and I'm comfortable with it. Great. So the first thing you guys should notice is that Travers already knows he likes first bounce and he's comfortable with it. That is the hardest part about becoming a trader, guys, is identifying what you even like. So like, like I said, not everybody likes short selling, not everybody likes longing. So he's already flushed out what he likes. Now, okay, so he says, right now I'm jumping between setups to find a second one. Each week it's something new, like I don't know if I should stick with day ones or branch out to multi-day setups. Brilliant question, Travers. I would say the best advice I can give on this, and I've given it for four years, is brother, go where the money is, not where the excitement is. Now that you know what you like, great. If you like first bounces and you like, um, you know, um, you know, those teleport candles and when shorts are stuck on very strong stocks, brother, you should, because, because it's hard to find what you like in the beginning, right? But now that you know that, I would do everything in my power to get as good as possible at that. Now, I'm not saying that you can't go to something else, but, but I would say that sometimes the grass isn't greener, right? It's, it's really not greener. It's like, oh, oh my gosh, like I've been with my girlfriend for three years, but if I get a new girlfriend, it's it like, you know, maybe she's got different aesthetics. I'm going to keep this PG-13, but is the grass green? The grass isn't greener. If you know what you like, that's what you like, and you need to become the LeBron fucking James edit. But I do understand the one, let me say it like this. I learned, well, I originally learned big caps, but then I learned small caps, but then I really learned big caps, not just started on them. So let me say it like this. I always have a play. When small caps are slow, guys, I'm balls deep into big caps. Sometimes I day trade big caps very, very randomly unless I get paid um, really good because I scooped it at the right time or whatever. But I wanted to learn two different sectors when one was slow. Not because I was having frustration with the other one, only because, okay, I'm good at short selling, but when there's no small cap plays, I still want to make money because I'm a goddamn degenerate. Hi, my name is, hi, my name is Tosh. I'm a degenerate. <laughs> like, like that is welcome to the party. Like grab a cup of coffee, take a seat. The, the, I want you to never make a decision, Travers, out of frustration or desperation. This is what I'm trying to get at for any of you. And this is why I want to flush his out is guys, I don't want you banging your head. So now you're going to go frustrate yourself even more when something isn't quote unquote mastered yet, or you have a really good handle on it. And AKA, what would be a really good handle on it? You're pretty profitable every time it comes around. If you are Travers really good at the first bounce and you really know what you're doing and you see a lot of consistency, brother, and obviously money, then you can go, well, you know, if I've mastered this one, I'm going to play it when it shows up. But now I want to graduate to another, not not go to another because I'm frustrated with the first one because you could get frustrated in the second one. And now you're going to bring in the frustration from both of them into all of them. Does that make sense, buddy? Does that make sense? I don't want you overloading your brain when you're not at step one first. And believe me, man, this is the hardest part to understand about day trading. This is the hardest part. It is very easy for a lot of people to make money because they're on their chapter 100 and 200. Alex makes making money in the market look easier than a, than a money printer in the Fed. It's just facts. But Alex is on a trajectory that might be light years ahead of anybody. Travers, you know, Kevin, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm not singling anybody out. I don't want you guys to get FOMO thinking he's making money. He's making money. He's making money. Now I got to make money or I'm an idiot. I'm a loser. It's not like that. The market's going to be here for a hundred years, guys. Plus, the, the, the only thing that destroys the market is if global warming or the co like a comet bashes into us like that new Leonardo DiCaprio movie and we get smoked or roasted. Guys, the market's going to be here. It's the U.S. economy in chart form. So what I mean is, is I would rather have you go at a slower pace and master something than try to learn multiples and frustrate all of you, just your, your mental capital in every form. This is about mastery. This is not about making money in the beginning. It's about, am I learning a language that I can teach my children and they can teach their grandchildren once I learn it correctly? Does that make sense? 
I've been consistent with the first bounce for about six months. So I don't think it's out of frustration, but I still have a long way to go of mastering it. I am probably trying to rush it. Travers, great, great um, analysis because while I was talking to you directly, brother, I didn't necessarily know if it was out of frustration. I was using that example so I could keep it general. So a lot of people who are going through frustration, maybe not jump the gun, but here's what I would say, man. If you feel like you're rushing in your process, it's the same feeling of like, I know I'm rushing in this trade. It's the same guys that, that said like, hey, I'm gonna buy from you know 26 to 29 because I wanna make a quick buck in iSig today. It's, it's that same mentality. So if you find yourself in this headspace of like, I need it, I need it, I need it, I'm rushing, I'm rushing, I'm rushing. Sometimes that's from actually like a, a resistance standpoint. Does that make sense? Like that's actually not a good standpoint. So I'm not saying you're rushing brother, I'm really not but I want you to go at it organically. Like, you know what, man, I'm really good at first bounces. I know how to do them. I love them. Now let's add, now let's add stress-free. Now let's start also learning something else I can take advantage of. Maybe options trading, maybe, maybe short selling death candles. Like I always talk about every single webinar, but I just want you guys to be clear headed when you take on something new. Yeah. That, that, that's my best advice. David, when I try a new strategy, I back test it for as long as it takes to know if I have an edge. Yeah, I mean, that's the best any of us can do, David. Definitely, definitely, right? And to see if you're comfortable with that specific setup. Okay, guys, hold on. Going back to threads. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo. Let's see. I'd like to hear about when a stock feels trappy, 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 trappy. So the things, like, I'm not so obsessed with the term trap. Like, what's this trap? The things that I just want you guys paying attention to is because because I think there's a cult, like this cult bias around this stock is trappy. I just want you guys to pay attention to the outliers, or I'm sorry, the underlying things that make a stock trap or go up and or just not continue to go down. The things that you need to be paying attention to are higher lows. Like number one, like th this is something you need to look out for guys. Like is a stock acquiring higher lows? Over VWAP, under VWAP, is a stock acquiring higher lows? Number two, is volume coming in? This random spurt of volume, do you see, I talk about this a lot with volume guys. This is what you have to pay attention to with traps or a stock just fading all day. That's a big, that's a big test of morning volume. So look at this. Remember what I always say, I always say, when the first hour is over, draw a line within the 40 to 50% mark of the morning volume. If at any point in the day, if the, you can eyeball it, 40 to 50%, if volume starts hitting this level, it could be a serious, it could be a little trap, it could be a serious trap, but it could be trouble for waiting for a late day fader or a stock to just tank all day and get sold off and sold off and sold off because volume is coming and volume is demand. Volume is action. Volume is we're like John Wick running with 10,000 guns. Volume is volume and participation. So if this stock is, and you want, if you're short here and you want this to go lower, but you simultaneously see higher, low, higher, low, and volume starting to really pick up. Um, I don't know, you know, cause there's so many times guys where you see something like this and then it just continues and then just keeps going. So like, again, I want you guys to stay away from just, hey, what's trappy versus what do I need to look out for? Like, like what's really like going against the thought process of a short right now? Because I just feel like, hey, this stock's trappy. Well, why is it trappy? That's kind of just a, that's kind of just a cop out, you know? I'm gonna long this because it feels trappy. Well, what's happening in the price action? Is volume coming in? Is it coupled with higher lows? Did it go over a tank? Like whatever it is, right? And these are the things that you need to pay attention to. Trend, how many people are stuck in it, et cetera, et cetera. Now, a stock that is this inflated after a major death candle, it's still trading under VWAP. Obviously, I wouldn't be too scared of this. And if you do what Bao does every single week, he's a channel trader. Where do you think Bao would have been shorting? He would have been shorting right here. You don't chase. He doesn't chase down here. Instead, he would have been shorting right here. So it would have been obviously right here at this level, right here, adding up to here probably risking a little over view up maybe half of this death count. So as you can see, and then he probably would have covered down here. So like you guys also have to, like if you're short selling and like waiting for these quote unquote traps to occur, you got to wait for a good entry as well, or just know that while it might not be a huge trap, it does have significant bounce coming or it has some action flowing in because of this little volume trip, et cetera, et cetera. I hope that's clear. I hope that's clear. Okay. Last question. 
how to narrow down the watch list for newer traders and not miss trying to chase money, uh, many of them, and get none? That's a good question, huh? I would say that when you go, SK, if you're listening, if you go to the watch list every single morning and like Alex puts on anywhere from like three to eight stocks, arguably we'll say an average is five like today, you only should be locating, brother, and really paying attention to the ones that you know personally you have an edge or you flush out or makes sense to you. Just because Alex is, has a plan to trade for all five doesn't mean you can one, simultaneously trade five stocks at once, um, you know, absorb that much data in the beginning. Because in the beginning, I remember, dude, I, I was like, oh my God, I can barely look at one stock. And then towards the end of it, I could be in eight stocks at one time managing positions. And if we're not even talking about swing trading, that's like 50 positions. Like, so my point is, is in the beginning, take it slow. Out of these five, what do I have locates for? And what's the number one at the top of my list? Maybe boil it down to two. But, but I don't want you guys racing. Like anytime it comes to racing, that is very much a problem in your head. It's just very much a problem, man. Because whether you're trying to rush process, whether you're trying to rush locates, whether you're trying to rush a death, anything, this is not a game for rushing. True trading and mastery, mastery trading, masterful traders who trade, I'll say it like that, it's very boring. We know what to expect. I'm not getting in this until the fucking death candles and then I'll wait for a pop. If the pop comes, great. Guys, it's as simple as this. I'm gonna wait for a death candle. I'll set limit orders once it happens right here. I like the 50% mark right here, right here. And then a stop right here. And then you can walk away. You could go take a shit if you wanted. You could go make breakfast. That's how boring trading can be, but how effective trading can be, how wonderful and profitable trading can be within boring is a lot of profit. <laughs> it sounds funny, but, but it's true. It's true. Uh, CPOP, trap like CPOP. Yeah, well, you know, the thing about CPOP like this on today is guys, higher lows, higher lows, higher lows, right? And it's ping pong, ping pong with Viva, ping pong, ping pong, back through, under, over, back through, over, under, death candle doesn't work, death candle, none of these are really death candles, but they don't work. So I don't like stocks that play ping pong. I don't play these. I don't, I don't play these. Look at that. This is a pre-market engage that maybe you do a morning, uh, like, like a morning um, scale and then drop cover. That's it. This is so wonky action, dude. I hate looking at this. It's just, it's chaotic. This is like a bipolar person. And then simultaneously, obviously the thing that you can really pay attention to on kind of like a macro end versus micro is like, it's just, this fucker just does not want to break down, right? It's just kind of like, that's kind of like a macro level of drawing, you know, dips that keep getting bought up. But even on a micro level, it's just, it's just through and through and back and I, it's too much. I want fluidity. I want clear. I want something that's clear. And also yesterday, look, it's like, it's just, I expected this today. So not my thing, but yes, I guess trap. It's more of a, it's more of just a, instead of more of a trap, it's more of just a price action um, clusterfuck of craziness. And as you guys can see, oh my God, this isn't rocket science. Tosh must be making some sense here. Let's draw the first hour of volume. Let's draw my famous line. I've never seen anyone did this. I've made this famous for the last four years when we first started MIC. Draw a line at the 40% to 50% mark. Where does it, it test all day? This is going to be a trap stock. If this were to fade off all day and just die and not trap, you would see the volume not breach probably this 25, 20% mark, 15 to 20, 30% mark at most. It wouldn't be hitting over these lines. That is how you read volume, my friends. And that, coupled with trend and everything else that you know in process is gonna help you. What's volume doing? Test, 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 test. Oh, trap, tank, trap, tank, trap. The action is wonky. Uh, thank you, T Bradley 90. Half of them are quite expensive to locate, hence I do remove them from the ones to trade. However, those are the usual. <laughs> you know what, SK, this is actually funny, buddy, but I'll, I'll say this. Um, and, and yeah, man, happy to help. So me and Alex have said this for years. We would rather trade the more expensive and the less acquired, uh, the more hard to borrow a stock is because, because when a stock is easy to borrow or, or the second part of that 
is it's not easy to borrow, but it has very, 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 very cheap locates, meaning you're really not paying for it and anybody can get the locate. They tend to be a lot harder for shorts because every dipshit with a trading account who doesn't know anything can get in the stock. So what happens when a stock is easy to borrow or at least unbelievably cheap to where everybody can acquire it, what happens? People are stopping out in two and cents and three cents. Oh my God, the stock jumped. I'm going to get out. They're freaking out, man. They're not traders. They don't know what to do. They're degenerates. See, you guys are traders. You guys are educated. You guys go into the locate situation and I want the most expensive locate because I know that only veterans are paying the most for that locate. <laughs> Travers, Travers is like, see, now this is my fucking MIC process. This is when I'm going long and getting you all you, I'm trapping all you dipshits, right? Yes, correct, brother, correct. And this is the language that you guys got to learn. The more the expensive locate and the more hard to borrow it is and the least amount of shares, this is why you got to be quick, is the better. Now, this is on a general sense. So not everything is 100% a protocol that's set in stone, but on a general sense, these are the ones that tend to fade easier. These are the ones that death candle. These are the ones that, tend to go lower and then lower and then lower because you need a lot of shorts to squeeze for traps, for stocks to you know, really gain momentum. And when a stock is easy to borrow, there's a lot of amateur shorts to get them out of their positions over and over and over and quickly and quickly and quickly. And it snowballs and snowballs into an avalanche and everybody's covered in the avalanche. And then sometimes you just get trappy action where nobody wins. Shorts are stopping out. Longs are getting dumped on. Shorts are stopping out. Longs are getting dumped on. Bingo, bango, bongo, this bipolar shit. And nobody, nobody wins on a stock like this, guys. Nobody wins on a stock like this. This is just the shorts that won got stopped out. The longs that thought they were up got dumped on. Nobody wins in a chart like that. They win in a chart like this. Some, well, sometimes, not necessarily everybody, because nobody's really going to probably anticipate unless you swung, swung short overnight, um, you know, something because this went in after hours. But you know what I mean? It's more just this is fluid up all day. This is just bing, bang, 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 bang. Like, <laughs> yeah. the only person that makes money on this is Val. Yeah, but, you know, even Val, man, sometimes, man, when you do short, say, like, this resistance level and it keeps going, you might get scared to stop out. Or even this one when you're like, wow, like, because you might want to short that resistance level right here. And then you're like, wow, 350. Like, so, again, Val uses a lot of risk with his channel trades, but he's good with them. He can kind of overpower a stock every now and then. Val is the one exception that, that gets profitable on a trade like this. Otherwise, this is kind of just a chop crap, you know? Yeah. Yep. Nice, SK, nice. Um, yeah, man. Ooh. Yeah, exactly, bro. Exactly. Bao is the one exception. That's what I'm saying. Because Bao is a channel trader extraordinaire. But even Bao stopped out on this one. As you can see, he got in right there. He stopped out, but then he got back in because he could see it kind of stuffed. And then obviously, like I was just saying, where he shorts, exactly where he short. I literally just said it before I saw that chart is this is where you short right here. But then see, he was willing to go up to 350. Not a lot of people would right? So th that's where you also got to have an understanding for risk and know what you're doing. This is, this is literally Bao's bread and butter. He loves the channels more than anybody I've ever met. In fact, I think if he could have one trade the rest of his life, I think it'd be channel trading, not because that's his most profitable, <laughs> wink, wink, if Bao's listening, it's actually low hanging fruit, but there's so much adrenaline and fun in the channel trades and you get to do it all day. And I know that's why Bao would pick it because he's a degenerate and I love it. That would go after the art of this industry versus the profit first. It does. It takes balls to scout, scale like Bao. Absolutely. And not everybody, well, and this is, this was my whole point. Um, trade engineer, th or uh, Dean, this was my whole point. 1% of traders are making money on a chart like this, the bows or the people who are educated MIC. I'm talking, again, I'm speaking in generalities here. I'm talking your everyday dipshit who stops out two cents, three cents. This, anybody with a trading account that doesn't know what they're doing, that's what we're talking about here. Nobody makes money on the grand scheme of things um, when you're talking like a general consensus. Does that make sense? Because every new trader with a trading account has no idea how to read this chart or what to do. Bows is the 1%, MIC is the 1% that knows that you can actually channel and trade and scalp these through whole and half dollar resistance areas, resistance levels based on overhead and just the general channel that you're waiting for. But when it comes to your everyday TD Ameritrade guy, he's getting smoked. He, no, nobody in TD Ameritrade is making money on this stock today. Like, I, I'm, like that's kind of a blanket statement. You know what I mean? But yes. Yes, correct. And this would even be hard for some veterans. 
You want fluid price action, guys. You want fluid. Damn, my tea got cold. <laughs> I've been talking so long, I forgot to drink my tea, man. I'm all hyped up over Verizon and SIM cards. Guys, do you have any more questions? House balls. I hope that's clear for you guys. I hope that's clear. You just blew my mind with that volume chart. Yeah, buddy, I'm telling you. Every single day, what you should do, Angel, I'm going to give you guys a homework assignment. Here, I'll use ISIG as a better example, right? Because this is actually the most clear example. Guys, I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you an example. Every single day, I want you guys from now on to do exactly what I'm doing. If you have TD Ameritrade, you could do something similar in DOS. You could just draw like a square. Just highlight it. Highlight it. That is the morning volume. Let's... Oops. Let's draw a line at the 40, that's arguably, you can eyeball it, 40% level. If it starts testing during the day and you're trading, now let me do a time frame uh, after the first hour, so zombie hour, to obviously reversal hour, which is 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern. What you guys are going to notice, oops, it's actually right there. Yeah, Arizona time's crazy. We're like, well, Arizona time's crazy, guys, because like out of the year, half the year, the market opened for me at 630, but I'm in the half of the year right now where it's 730 because we don't do we do not do daylight savings. I don't know if people know that. So Arizona, um, half the year, dude, I'm only two hours behind Alex or Eastern Standard Time versus half the year being three. It's very confusing. So I'm always like, wait, where's reversal hour again? Like what fucking time for me? <laughs> so 2 p.m., Easter said, did I even get that right? Yeah, maybe, whatever. Um, but you guys, just if you're trading midday and you start seeing, you start seeing these tests of the 40 to 50% level, you know that there could be, there could be some action afoot or you know it could get trappy or choppy or crazy or, and then if we go back, right? Um, what was this? What was the name of the song? OCP pop. Oh, God, I always forget this one. It drives me nuts. Uh, C pop, C pop. I always do an O first every time I see that damn ticker. So as you guys can see, you can draw the 40% line and it's just, of course it's a trap all day and it's just crazy price action. VPA book by Anna Coolings is a great resource. Tosh, I ask myself always, is the stock, if the stock is so bullish, why are we seeing these upper wicks and compare the spread from previous candles on the five minute understand the market anomalies? Yeah, the thing is, the thing is, instead of getting crazy, SK, on like so, like every specific of a stock, the, the, the three things I want you guys really paying attention to in the beginning, and, and this works on every chart, is who is stuck? Like how much overhead, right? That's the general who is stuck. What does the volume look like? And also, what's the trend? Like what's the trend? Like where's VWAP in relation to the trend? Like I'll give you guys an example. What, or um, what was that one? Uh, I think it was, was it Pixie this morning? I think it was Pixie. Yeah, here's a good example, right? Okay, when a stock is very fluid, right? And I talk about this weekly. When a stock is very fluid under view up and you don't have ping pong action like CPOP, I almost said OCOP, like CPOP, what you get is a stock that's trading way under view up and it hasn't done back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The ideal situation is it to pop to VWAP and then you get a short on scaling to the next resistance level, probably arguably 220. But like if you get that VWAP pop, that's where you go. But if stock is opening close to VWAP or on VWAP or playing ping pong the whole way like CPOP, what you're going to notice is that they pop considerably more. See, because now it's opening so close to VWAP, what you guys should be noting is now you short at the previous resistance levels. You know, like these are the levels, right? Like this is the levels of previous resistance because this, this support became a ceiling on the way up. So now it's like, I need to hit outer lines because it's playing ping pong with VWAP all pre-market. It's doing this bipolar shit that's just not giving an edge to something so fluid. You either have a fluid stock or you don't. It's kind of that simple, man. It, it really can be a lot of the time. And sometimes it's very fluid and sometimes it's not. And here's the thing about anything that's really strong going into the day. You know that there's probably going to be a rush of anticipatory um, sheep or buyers or uh, pumpers because anything that's super high, they want higher. They just do. 
So don't act on this until you get, like Alex said, your confirmation. Dude, obviously the quick guy that's like, hey man, I just gotta be quicker than the other sheep. I longed at 24, 2405 and I used a market order, which he filled fucking 26, 22. The point is you have to be too quick to make this money. And that's just not trading. That's just kind of gambling. That's just kind of going with the flow. That's like the Verizon guy. Just he's half dead inside. That's a zombie. He has no plan of action. He's just trying to beat the clock. You want to wait for the confirmation. So if a stock is way over VWAP and it continues, wait for that top out. This stock was over VWAP. It wasn't under, it didn't play ping pong. It was probably going to launch. It was probably going to see some real fluidity, some, some real action in the upside, some real momentum. At least, quote unquote, continue the trend it's on. Hey, what a revelation. I say, going straight up in the morning before the death candle, continuing the trend it was on over VWAP. Candle's getting bigger. Bing bong, like literally candle's getting bigger. People getting stuck. Um, uh, what was the other one that we were talking about? Pixie. Overhead pre-market, not a crazy amount of volume, not much life. Didn't even play ping pong through view up. Oh, what a coincidence. It didn't do shit all day or it bled. It continued trend. It continued the trend it was on. Stocks continue the trends that they're on. Unless they pull a 180 on you, that's why we have a stop loss in place. Otherwise, trends continue to trend. And I'm winded. <laughs> Guys are killing my voice, man. <laughs> or maybe it's just me. Sometimes I bring too much passion in and then I'm like, damn, I'm white by the end of it. <laughs> I get too amped, dude. I, I love talking stocks. Guys, any more questions? These are really good questions today, man. I, I'm really glad we recorded this one today because these are, these are some sick questions, man. You guys are doing good. If you got more, shoot them, shoot them. Don't be shy. I got at least 20 more minutes that I can sit with you guys before I got to go uh, beat up Apple and complain about their greeter who doesn't want to help people. <laughs> now I actually have an appointment this time. <laughs> yes, seriously. Um, yeah, you can angel. It, it, let me tell you something, man. Algos are in this shit all day after the first hour. It's, it's just an algo sesh all day. And the algos that you can see in price action are the channels. That's what the algos are, right? And specifically when you see something like institutional ownership and all that stuff, you're going to see it in the charts, brother. Like CPOP, it was probably super algo driven um, because it's just this, like, dude, these stocks that like are not super fluid, you can tell they're algos. But there's algos everywhere, man. These, every stock has a crazy amount of algos these days. It's nuts. What's the best practice to minimize emotions when trading? Tony, 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 that is... That is a very <coughs> loaded question, brother, because everyone is so different. My God, everybody is different. And what I think is going to help another might not help the next, but on a general consensus, yes, I was going to say, Travers, on a general consensus, the number one thing to do is to size down and to do wider stops. So you're correct there, brother. But if you're talking about like the best practice that's not necessarily trading related. I mean, like, I don't know, classical music, drink a big water, take a deep breath, like put some heavy metal on, what relaxes you? What's gonna get you to not be on the edge of your seat like you're watching Sandra Bullock in Gravity and on your high emotion and you're off kilt? You know what I mean? You gotta keep that gyroscope in your body and in your brain on, on the correct path. And the best way to do it when, it, when it's actually trading related is just always have a plan and to size correctly, which I would actually change that, Travis, to not size down, size correctly, because it goes both ways, right? If you're sized too little, you, your emotions might be fucked up because now you, now you, 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 you may have fucked up your emotions because you fucked up a good trade because you're not sized appropriately, or you really messed up your emotions because you are sized too much and now you're just losing. Like, like does that make sense? So I, at the end of the day, guys, it's all about planning. It's planning your size. It's planning the trade. It's planning everything about what you try to do. And that's, that's the number one thing to focus on is I, I don't want to wing anything. The, the, the number one people that get their emotions all crazy or, or always on adrenaline and crazy emotions are the people that just shoot from the hip, throw random darts. Do not pl plan. Do not read the watch list. Do not go in the main chat, read commentary. Do not um, just have a clear path and vision for what they should expect intraday. 
they're just on the edge of their seat 24 seven or sized incorrectly. Yep. How long before you cancel fantasy orders after opening, assuming nothing is popping on that ticker 10 minutes after open? No, Sonny. No, not at all, brother. If uh, the first half hour, I give it time. It, it, in the first half hour, my plan should, according to plan, with the fantasy orders or the broken trend. Yeah, unless arguably, arguably, unless there is a teleport candle and it's very weird. Like sometimes, man, you reactionary take your, take your fantasy orders off or whatever because it just doesn't feel right. And a lot of this industry, as Bao told me a long time ago, is sometimes you actually have to be guided by your gut. And if you have a really shit feeling of like, oh my God, like I actually had a plan for this, but it's not, it, it's rare, but it's not feeling good. I actually cut the orders. And, and sometimes it saves me. I can't tell you how many times over the last eight years it has actually saved me. But then sometimes I was a pussy and then I did lose out on money because I canceled my plans. It hit them and then I was like, oh man. I was not strong with the force that day, my friend. Having a plan in place and knowing how much you lose if the trade goes against you is the best way to control emotions. Correct. It's not, correct. 100%. It's plan and it's sizing correctly. Another thing that helped me was putting away my P&L window and, and, and not look at it until I'm done and out of the trade. See, that edge stock is only 50% of the time because while that actually helps you, there's a lot of traders that are going to freak the shit out when their P&L is not on their screens. Like when they actually don't have access to it. And typically, typically, I will say those are for the people using a crazy amount of size. Yes. If you're using a little bit of size or under, you can definitely take the P&L window box out and it's even easier to calculate the money you're either up or down. But I have noticed there's a correlation between people who use really big size and then minimize that box are shitting their pants. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Mbot, uh, question on YouTube, Edward. What makes Mbot a good trade day one like alex takes on the daily uh seems to always take a day well this is not day one though edward this is like day three of the run so if we go to like a 30-day chart this is day one brother and then we just either wait for death candles or stuff moves on day one but if it's but if it's broken this is day three you want outer lines so so like you can you can just put on your pivot lines so let me add to pivots you can just do your pivot line so this would have been the area to scale because you never hit the bottom pivots. That just doesn't even make sense. You're a chaser. So you would hit the outer pivot. So you would wait for it if it did pop to these levels. That's, that's how we do something like MBOT or a day one, day two, day three. It's as simple as that, brother. Any more than that is just kind of overcomplicating. Make sense? T Bradley 90, I've noticed that many of the low hanging fruit do pop later in the day and fade from there on a low volume. I was told to put the orders on the outer lines only, but these don't. Um, but these don't go that far, but they do. Oh, uh, yeah. The thing with the thing with low hanging fruit guys is like something like this. So like, I'll just put the pivot points back on. If I was looking to short the outer pivot on MBOT, which is the case, you want these outer pivots. If it doesn't hit in the first 30 minutes, I'm not interested anymore. I don't care if it hits midday or end of it. Like I'm not getting into this because it shouldn't be hitting those levels that late in the day. Does that make sense? It shouldn't be hitting those levels. But if it does in the first 30 minutes, I'm interested. And the quicker, the better on these things because it's usually a pop. It's, it's like a cash grab. It's like a, it's like a pop and go. It's, it's almost like, you know what it is? It's almost like, hey man, we got to make a bank robbery. Let's do this as fast as humanly possible. It's going to be more, more effective. Does that make sense? I don't, I don't like these bank robbers taking their time. They're going to get arrested. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, Edward, I hope that helped, buddy. Uh, SK. Yep. Answer your question. Yeah. That, that's a great question though. That's a really good question. Any more like that? Outer lines or miss the trade. That's my Bible. Outer lines. I only want to trade when I'm comfortable. It does help though, guys, that I'm always like invested in like a swing trade. So like my P and L is fluctuating. 24 seven, whether I like it or not, because I have swing trade accounts. So I always feel immersed in the stock market. I, there's never a day where I don't have a play because I'm always in something. So that does help with that. It's not something I necessarily recommend because it's like, 
um, you're just always getting your fix, but it is something to think about. It really is. And that makes me more selective on like a day where I don't have a perfect low hanging fruit or a perfect death candle or a perfect day trading situation because I got long-term expiration options trades going on. I got 30 tech accounts I like, you know, long, what, like whatever. But, but there's always skin in the game 24 seven when you have many, many multiple trading accounts like I do and different styles. So it's just something to think about. It's not even a recommendation. It's just something to think about. And it has helped me over the years to be way more selective with what I love to trade in small caps because I'm always in. I've got my fix. We're professional degenerates. <laughs> uh, Travers, what is the psychology behind the low hanging fruit pops on day two? I could only think maybe overnight shorts covering at 930 to pop it up. Not sure if it, not sure if there is one set reason. There's no one set reason, brother, but what it is, is so like, this is like a day two, right? Hold on, let me expand this. Here's what you gotta know. These are the number one things that you gotta know about a day two play. Day one is the major catalyst move. This stock has not done anything for a little while, and now it's up. This is day one of the move. There's a new catalyst. You go to the news. There's a new summary of why ticker XYZ or ABC or BTC um, is up. This is day one. This is a catalyst. Now, by the end of the day one, the stock is either holding pretty well or it's not. And by the time the market opened on day two, which you can see right here, the shaded is pre-market, then after hours, pre-market, and then after hours, um, and then this is day one, this is day two. So what you can see is if it would have stayed up here, let me draw this. If this stock would have stayed up here and held its gains overnight and into pre-market, this is actually troublesome. I don't want a piece of this anymore for a short. I really don't. But when a stock gives back a huge majority of gains by day one, what you have are people losing hope in the stock. Now, two things happen on day two, in my opinion, as I'm not honestly 100,000% sure on this, but you do have shorts covering, the shorts that are in the money, and you get, sometimes you get like, like you see these immediate spikes, like obviously like this, but you see it more like in the immediate open, shorts covering, and just a general honestly, I hate to say it, lack of a better phrase, but just dipshit buyers who don't know anything. They go, this great stock ran from $5 to $10 day one. Guess what? I'm getting on a dip. Oh my God. I'm going to be a millionaire by the end of the day. I'm buying it at seven. It's going to go to 10 by the end of the day, maybe 30 by day three. This is the mindset. And then when it jumps and then drops, it's because there are so many resistance points of sellers of people who are stuck on day one that this just has almost no option but to just crater anytime it really pops if it's got this massive overhead and stuff that it does like even this midday pop which i wouldn't be shorting because it's past zombie rule but as you can see it's just there's so much volume and if you have a volume profile like on dos or something and you put it up you can see that the majority of the volume is right here stuck it's going to be right here that's where all the action was right it's going to be probably right here so this level let me move them. This level to this level has the volume. So anytime it pops up, you know, obviously there's resistance points everywhere and people really are underwater, but damn dude, when it pops up at these levels, now you really got sellers. It happened two times. Once down, once down. But in the beginning, you have people who are just, hey man, I'm in, this stock's gonna go back to 10 again, let me buy. Oh shit, ran into a wall of sellers or shorts covering. And obviously when you cover it, it becomes a buy. Selling off the old chick and hunting down the hot chick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a way of life, Dean. It's a way of life. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm gonna get in trouble from HR if she's listening. Um, yo, what's up, Asborn? So I hope that makes sense, guys. With oh, and 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 just here's a general rule of thumb. Like I said, with pivot points, is this is your guide for day twos or day threes? Where do I want to be shorting? So obviously this is going to be set for the day three because we're on day three. But as you guys can see, this is the line where you have the most comfort. Now, yes, you can short into that level. So you actually could hit 860 if you're willing to scale up to nine, but you can do what a lot of us do at MIC is line to line, wait for just before the line, on the line and over the line. And if they're far apart like this is, if you're wrong, cut it immediately and hit the outer line. But it's outer lines. 
It's pivot points. That's your guide on day twos or low hanging fruit. Something that is broken down heavily, opening very far under a day before that was strong or a day, you got it, a day one, if you guessed that correctly. Yeah, buddy. Oh, yeah. Yep. Wow, spy, man, just freaking strong. A little bit longer, guys, about 15 more minutes. Well, pivot points are just pivot points are just very specific, brother, for day twos or day threes. Like this is what you just want. And oops, let me remove. There are points of resistance that you or support that you should really pay attention to based on how the stock is doing. So, like I said, they're not made really for a stock that's like strong. Like you can use them, but it's really for the, not the Pixies, um, the, um, what was the stock that we were just on? I swear to God, man, my memory is so bad. Literally, what was the stock we were just on? I'm losing my mind. <laughs> was it, oh, not, not, I said, um, what was the one that was the day three? Not CPOP. No, no, no. The, literally the one I was, oh, MBOT. Thank you. I'm losing my mind. It's made for stocks that were forgot about. It's the day twos and day threes. So it's it, it, literally, this is where you get the most use out because a day one is, um, a day one is you do the normal identifiers, the normal process of trend and confirmations of stuffs and death candles and just outer lines based on where the stock is opening per VWAP. But when it comes to, you know, these are just the most perfect resistance levels on a broken stock that tells you where the massive ceilings are. It's as simple as that, SK. It's as simple as that. Or who asked that? Whoever asked that. Uh, Chuck. Hey, thanks, man. Happy to help. If you don't have pivot lines, uh, Joe Kelly shared this Google Doc that creates the lines and calculates them for you guys. Uh, this is specifically TD Ameritrade. So we have, a, we have a video in the chat called Setting Up Lines where you can get this on your TD Ameritrade. I only use these for charts. This is obviously not for trading. Yeah, happy to help, Chuck. Um, this is definitely not for trading. If anything, swing trade account with TD Ameritrade if you want to. But, but this is, guys, this is, this is not for day trading. So you want to put your pivot lines, unless you've been addicted to TD Ameritrade charts for eight years like I have and just can't get rid of them, um, you should put it on your DOPS. It'll look pretty similar. It should look almost identical. But this is just specifically uh, TD Ameritrade. I've just been with them. I, 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 it's like a cult following at this point. They're not the best out there, but I'm just so in love with them that simultaneously you can have your DOS open for execution boxes with level two because their level two is dog shit. I mean, their level two guys is like, oh my God. I, I can't even read this, dude. Like it's all freaking blue. It's not differentiating colors. I've actually reached out to them over the years and I was like, if you guys want to actually attract day traders eventually, like get your level two right. Dude, seriously, that is the saddest excuse for a level two I've ever seen coming from DOS. Like that's crazy. I, I, I do my, I have to squint my eyes just to differentiate the print, the colors, but, it's, but again, guys, is TD Ameritrade is not made for day traders. They're made for long-term investors. I've asked so many times just get different colors. That's funny. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. SK pivot script for TOS. Perfect. Uh, Chuck, it's like knowing there's a girl that would treat you better, but the second <laughs> In case I got HR and listening, I can't comment too much. <laughs> She's going to roast me. We joke, of course, guys, but it's just fun. Tay would kill me if I rant on that. <laughs> yeah, man. And everything I've talked about today, guys, let me go back to the announcements channels. Everything I've talked about today has a really good description in my process. Just go to announcements channels and just download this. Um, if you're new, what's process in general? What do I look for? You know, what's a good explanation? What are some good examples? This is a DOS execution chart. See, not TD Ameritrade. Um, and then, you know, like I said, ping pong, you know, outer lines, right in the resistance levels, um, ping pong, and also... This was kind of a day two, because if you look at something like this, I know it says a day one, but anything that runs after hours, guys, is a day two in my eyes. So I treat them more like a day two. So this was like an outer pivot line that day that I just coupled with playing ping pong, outer lines, that's what I wanted. Um, this was something that I talked about fluid charts all day. This is an example. I tried to give an example of everything I talked about today in this. 
it's like stocks, you know, not playing ping pong through view off. It's got a ton of overhead. It's really kind of forgotten about, you know, it, it ramps up and does a long journey to view off. That's where the short is. That's the outer line. Same here, same exact here. And then I followed this down. I was more aggressive back then. I don't do too much following down anymore, but as you can see, simple death candle play, reactionary trade, just wait for the death candle. Same here. Um, just give you guys an idea, man, of, you know, wait for the stuff move before getting in on the pop. Um, wait for a top. I try to give every example possible. Day two, again, you know, where's the volume stuck? Outer lines probably coupled with a pivot point, the 22 mark, 22.50. Uh, same here. Yeah. Oh, that's where I got that photo. Yep. None of this is investment advice, but just a guy I use daily. And then here's things like this, you know, like, like here's some shorting rules, no shorting front side day one. Very good. That'll save you a lot of headache. A lot of stuff, a lot of good stuff. We give it our all at MIC, guys. I think you're going to get a lot of value if you become a member and check out our content and, you know, what's going to, what's going to help you and things like that. Uh, let's see. How do I get pivot points? I'm using T. Ah, dude, I have no idea, Sonny. I'm sorry, man. I, I, I don't personally use TZ, uh, so I don't know, brother, but I, I'm sure you can contact them if they do have that option. Um, oh, sick. LB just said it's a simple calculation, so nice. Hey, maybe a, maybe a tab partner situation going on here. But guys, this is the power of the community, so just DM each other and get help. Like this is, here, here's a general rule of thumb. Guys, go to the After Hours channel anytime you really need help. It's not just me, Bao, Alex, or Ahmad. Type in, hey, who's got experience with blah, blah, blah? Like, can you help me? Can you answer this question? Guys, you have so many members to help educate you, help you, whatever it is. Nice. Tom Diesel sent Bao a chateau, uh, what looks like Gizawa. I have no idea how to say that, but nice. It's just fun, man. You can network in here. Trade Trader zero zero made five G say nice job, you know wire out accordingly. Another website to calculate pivots easier. There you go. Yeah, I mean I wouldn't even think about too much about pivots. Just once you get them on your platform, just utilize them because the MIC process around them works. Not so much of why exactly is this line here and this and that. they work, man. They've been working for Bow for twenty years. In pivot lines, we trust Tyler Durden style. Do you guys have any questions on YouTube or chat? Any last minute questions? Anybody on YouTube, don't be shy. If you do have questions about signing up, you can obviously text me or anything like that. Um, I'll answer your questions, get you started in the club, um, maybe running some promotions. So just text my line. We'll see case by case, by case, case by case. Because for someone who wants to upgrade to lifetime that's been in two weeks versus a guy that's been in seven months, that's obviously going to be a different case, right? It's case to case. Yep. But as you guys can see, man, 2022 is going to be awesome. Tosh, did you watch Bull Durnham yet? I, I have not. What's that, buddy? Wait, is that the, is that the comedian? Isn't it Bill Durnham? I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Dude, for the last three days, I've been trying to figure out this damn freaking phone, man. Baseball. Baseball movie. Hold on. What? What you talking about, Willis? How do I not know this? Bull Durham. Bro, I don't think I've ever heard of this movie before. Is it Kevin Costner? The fuck? Oh my God. That's crazy, man. How have I never seen this before? Is this good? <laughs> Dean, I'm getting there too, pal. <laughs> Sonny, the new Spider-Man was dog shit, dude. Oh my God. It was so bad. I was like depressed after, not because I was like so let down by the movie. It, I literally like the entire movie was like, I have, I'm wasting my life. I have to get out of here. Sorry, Chuck. I hated it. Unless you're talking about Bill, Bull Durnham, the new Spider-Man. Dude, I will check this out immediately, bro. Is this on Netflix or something? Let me see. I hope so. Where can we view this? Maybe Hulu? Nice. I have like every streaming platform possible, man. Literally. If, if there's a streaming platform, I got it. <laughs> so I'll find it somewhere. I'm going to watch it tonight, man. Awesome. Dude, the new Matrix was so sick. Oh, my God. 
the new Matrix is, a, dude, it, it, I, I'm a diehard fan of the Matrixes for two reasons. Um, I know like I'd celebrity name drop on here. It's just funny, man. My family knows so many people. We lived in LA most of my life. Um, um, Trinity, the actress who plays Trinity is one of my mom's best friends for the last 40 years before she even got Matrix. So like, I've got kind of like, I literally like, I was held by Trinity as a baby, like more times than you can count. Like they were family friends. So, um, you know, Carrie Ann Moss. Um, so I, I love those movies in support of like a real, like, family friend she's kind of like an aunt to me but outside of that i just grew up with the matrix trilogy and i love it so much and dude you you gotta see the new man i think it was so beautifully done i loved it man alex loved the first 70 percent of it then he was like ah oh, man i don't know the end dude but <laughs> yeah bro one day she offered me this white pill and i was like this doesn't look like a matrix option <laughs> no <Nah>, i'm kidding <laughs> trinity what the fuck this looks like molly not the, not the red pill. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, dude, they are the Wachowski sisters. Yeah, not the brothers anymore, man. Crazy, right? And only Lana Wachowski did the new one um, because of a uh, family trauma. Crazy stuff. But, you know, I'm, I, I really try not to judge. Like, I'm like, hey, be you um, as long as you don't hurt anybody. But, yeah, that's, that's kind of crazy. I've never heard of a case story where both of them convert, like brothers to sister. Kind of crazy. But hey, got to live your life, right? Um, yeah, so, you know, we kind of just every now and then talk movies and stuff. Guys, it's a fun podcast. It's just a way to kind of vent. And uh, if you have any more trading questions, I got five more minutes. But other than that, we can just kind of end on some movie talk. I, I think this was a pretty, pretty informative webinar today, man. We talked a lot of stuff. Low hangers, day ones, uh, you know, pivot points, confirmations, basically everything, how to get started. Never heard of brothers together. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, man. New Matrix was awesome. The only reason why I didn't like the new Spider-Man other than like one or two things from it, which was really cool. Uh, the only reason why I didn't like it is because I just cannot stand an ad adolescent Spider-Man. And I know, I know, I know he's supposed to be like 17. But dude, hearing the banter between Zendaya who looks like a 12 year old and then Spider-Man, Peter Parker, what's his, uh, Tom something. Um, I like Tobey Maguire, Spider-Man. He's older. He's an adult. I can't stand the high school bickering bullshit. I want to claw my eyes out the minute I hear these kids complain about kid stuff. I'm just, I feel like an 80 year old man in my body. I don't want to listen to kids. That's just me though. That's just my gripe with it. But again, if you like that stuff, it might be a great movie for you. Oh my God, dude. Spider-Man versus Matrix, Matrix every day of the week. Even though Spider-Man is my favorite and always has been my favorite superhero, but I loved the Tobey Maguire ones back in the day because it was new, it was fresh. Nothing like that had ever really been done. And it was very adult. Like as kid as it was, it was adult. It was, it was adults playing the roles. And even Andrew Garfield was more of a kid when he did his version of Spider-Man. But again, Andrew Garfield was an adult. The kid was like 40 years old or um, like 30 years old when he did the role or something like that, maybe 25. I just, I, when, you have, when you have a 17 year old in high school talk about high school things, I, I can't do it, man. It's, it's bubblegum Spider-Man and I hate that. I never watched The Witcher, bro. I probably should get into it. I don't like super grotesque movies. I Scary, I don't care. Action, I love all that stuff. But like, it's just gross, dude. Like I'll be eating dinner and watching The Witcher, the, the Witcher and I don't want to eat anymore. It's, it's like it's like popping Texas Chainsaw Massacre on. It's like, God, dude, I'm going to lose my appetite watching all this blood and guts and shit. I'm not really into gore, man. I'm really, I never have been. That's a tough one for me. But I ain't hating. Do you? <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, that's fun. That's funny that my I, my uh, my my sister is obsessed with, like, and her husband. They're just obsessed with that Witcher stuff, man. They they even listen like the the uh, the books on tape and audiobooks and stuff. Like I lost interest in Superman with the new actor, but love Batman. When it, oh, do you know what's interesting, man? The new Batman. I have no excitement or for but no like judgment i just want to see what happens when it happens with robert pattinson because he's a good actor um and like colin farrell and all those guys but like 
I have I, like I'm not excited for it, but I'm not gonna judge it. Like I'm just gonna go see it and have an opinion after I see it. But it's curious. It's definitely curious. Guys, let's end here because I'm absolutely winded. My freaking my voice is hoarse. But let me tell you something, man. I hope you guys got some value out of this webinar today. Um, I definitely, I love all this talk about movies and stuff. We'll do this next week. If you guys have any last minute questions, you can obviously just DM me if you're a member. If you're not a member, this is the perfect time to sign up for MIC. Guys, we raise rates every year. We're changing things. Alex even teased the fact that one day we're going to get rid of the annual and just go lifetime. Unless you're already a member, of course, we don't kick people out and then not honor their grandfathered price. But if you're looking into coming into MIC right now, I'll hook you up on the annual or the lifetime so we can lock you in. And, and uh, let me just be clear for anybody out there who's wondering, um, anybody who's an annual, what the grandfather means, guys, is whatever price you pay now, that's going to be auto charge the, the following year. So obviously our annual is 4K, but not, not everybody bought it for that because they maybe waited for a Black Friday deal or something. So if you get locked into an annual um, deal at whatever rate that you paid, that's going to that's gonna be the next year and that's going to be the following year. So you're always locked into a good price and you're never, ever, ever going to get eye gouged because we raise prices in the future. That's for new members. That's for people who missed the boat on taking action. And like we do, you know, we always rise because we are like the spy. We're a good stock basically. And we provide a lot of value. So, um, and we give you guys time. So just know that, you know, price raising may be coming in 2022. It's going to be a great year for all of us. But if you're already in, you're already on a plan, guys, you're good. You're secure. Don't worry. Uh, but if you want to get in now, there's probably no better time. And guys, cheers to the new year, man. But the next webinar I'll be giving, it will literally be in 2022. So I love you guys. Um, great webinar today, man. Thank you for the support. And we will do this again next week, guys. I will see you next week.